Good afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch. Welcome back to this workshop, which will be covering the topic of the development of translators' skills over the course of their careers. Uh, my name is Ryan Porter, and I'm a translator for the European Commission, and I translate for the English department at DG Translation. Uh, I've got a couple of logistical points to mention before we get started. Firstly, if anyone looks at their name tag and has a smiley on that name tag, you're registered for the uh, discussion event which is taking place downstairs in what's called the Jenkins room. So if you look at your name tag and you find that you've got a smiley on that, you've still got time to leave, uh, your discussion is taking place downstairs. And no panelists, you have to stay, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> And the other point is that I would remind you that we are accompanied by interpreters for this session. The interpreters will be uh, interpreting the session simultaneously into English, French, and German. German on channel one, English on channel two, French on channel three. I therefore encourage you to speak between those three languages, the language that you're most comfortable in. I'd also remind you to please speak slowly and clearly. And if you do wish to use any obscure or strange acronyms, please do try and explain them. It'll certainly help me understand you and will probably make our interpreters' lives easier as well. Other than that, I'd like to get the session underway. As I've said, it's to do with the development of translators' skills over the course of their careers. I think the sheer fact that there's so many of you here in the room is a sign that you certainly, as members of the profession, consider it to be a relevant topic. I'd say, however, that views do vary on this particular issue, uh, partly to do with the fact that the uh, sector is made up of translators of all sorts of different profiles, have on the one hand uh, freelance uh, translators, on the other hand uh, staff in-house translators, you have translators working in the public sector, and translators working in the private sector, and they all have differing degrees of uh, support when it comes to their own professional development. But they also have differing degrees of access to training resources. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we are joined today by a panel that represent a cross-section from across the profession. Uh, and they will be talking to you about their experiences and their knowledge on this particular topic. So I'm going to go through and uh, introduce them to you. Have, beginning on my right, so the far right, we have uh, Megan with us, Megan Smith. Megan is a master's student from the University of Manchester. She's in fact just completing her master's, and she'll be talking to us today, today about the findings from her master's thesis. She's expecting the grade for that any day now, but I'm reliably informed that today's presentation will have no impact on the final mark, so Megan, the pressure is off. Uh, we then have to my right again, we have uh, Martina Bajic. Martina works at the uh, University of Rijeka in Croatia, and she is uh, a lecturer in uh, legal terminology in German, English, and EU terminology. Uh, she will be presenting together with, on my left, uh, Victoria uh, Olnik-Kunz, and she works at the, she's come to us from Slovenia, where she works at the University of Ljubljana, and she's also one of the founding presidents of the Aso Slovene Association of Court Interpreters, Sworn Court Interpreters and Translators, and she'll be speaking in her capacity as that founding president today. And last but by no means least, on my far left, we have Miss Anne Brooks. Anne Brooks has come to us from the United Kingdom. She works for the UK's Institute for Translation and Interpreting, and she works uh, for the ITI, which you'll probably know it as, and she works there as their professional development officer. Uh, just before we get started on the presentations, when I was thinking about the topic, uh, I was considering it quite carefully in my capacity as a translator myself. And what struck me is that when it comes to the development of translator skills once they're in the profession, so the continuing professional development of translators, there are kind of two ends of the spectrum. 
On the one hand, you've got this idea that as a translator, a lot that you learn, you can learn on the job. And as you go about translating, you can be researching your, the subject matter that you're translating about, thereby acquiring skills. You can be consolidating your language skills. And you can also be getting more familiar and learning new features about the technology that we use. That's one way of thinking about the professional development of translators in the profession. The other side, of course, is this idea that you can attend uh, structured or formal training. So go to courses dedicated to the subjects that we translate about, the technology that we use as new technology emerges, and also uh, language training too, to enhance your language skills. And so, in fact, as we've been using Slider this morning, I've set up a question precisely on that, and I encourage you to think about that over the course of the session. The question which I'm hoping will appear is essentially the most effective way for translators to ensure their continuing professional development is by experience, by learning on the job, by attending formal training, or by another means. So if at some point in the, uh, over the course of this session, you've maybe zoned out a little bit, uh, I'd encourage you to maybe take a couple of seconds out to vote on that particular topic. We'll probably come back to the results of that at the end. So I think at this point, I'd like to get started with the presentations. So as I said, we're beginning on my right, and it'll be Megan Smith. So over to you, Megan. And just to remind you, sorry, that we'll be doing questions and answers at the end of each presentation. So please, if you could either submit them via Slido or make a note of them, and we'll be taking questions right at the end. Okay. Hello. And if we could have Megan's presentation, please. <laughs> Okay, hi everybody. Um, as you know, um, I've been introduced. My name's Megan. Um, I'm actually a master's student at the University of Manchester. Um, I get my dissertation results for this project that I'm presenting today next week. So um, excuse me if it's not all correct and, and right and what you want to hear. Um, I haven't actually had the grade yet, so fingers crossed I will be graduating next month. Um, just to give you some insight, I'm actually looking at a screen here. Um, I will try to address everybody, but I have to look at this where it is, so. Okay, so just to give a bit of insight into um, why I chose this as my research project. So, oh, hang on, sorry. Um, I was particularly interested before I or undertook this master's degree, I looked at jobs um, in translation at being a languages graduate. I graduated with Spanish and teaching English as a foreign language. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I did know that I've always really, really enjoyed translating. So I looked at a career in that area to find that most of the places I was looking seemed to require some formal academic training in the form of a master's degree and um, some other translation qualification. So it did become apparent that this wasn't going to be easy for me unless I did have a formal qualification. Um, I was already working, my full-time job is I work in Manchester Metropolitan University um, in the international office promoting Erasmus exchanges to students. So I undertook my master's part-time, so I've been doing it for two years around my full-time job. Um, and I thought, why not? I'm going to go for it. Let's see where we get. Um, everybody on my course thought I was crazy for taking a research dissertation because we did have the option to do a, a translation, a practical. Um, but there we go, I really enjoy research, so hopefully you, you will as well. Um, what the focus of this presentation will be, um, my question was what skills, abilities and training does a freelance translator need to possess? Um, I did base it on freelance translators in the UK, um, but I'm going to focus more so on the skills side of the, of the present, on, on my research today. So, okay. So just to give some insight into what I actually did, um, I surveyed 24 translators, UK-based freelance translators, and I provided them with a range of questions on their, their attitudes, their possession of um, formal training, their, basically their opinions on, on a range of questions regarding formal academic training, continued, continued professional development, and skills generally. So just to give some insight into um, 
perhaps if you notice, you might not, but the numbers vary on the two charts that are up on the screen right now. Um, this is because there was different numbers of people, of respondents answering different questions. So th these are two of the questions that I took from my research. And it was the importance of holding an undergraduate and postgraduate degree in translation, in an area of translation. Now, I did specify by, uh, there was other um, formal academic training options provided. These are what I did want to focus on today, which was the undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. As you can see, people were fairly neutral on the importance of holding a degree in translation. This personally surprised me um, because everything up until this point had indicated that we, I needed a formal degree in translation um, to be a successful translator. The, there was almost all of the participants who, who responded held an undergraduate degree, but just one of them was in translation. Um, whilst the postgraduate degree holders, there was 13 out of 23 and 11 of those were a translation, a translation master's degree. So that did reinforce my decision for, for undertaking the master's degree, at least. It made me feel confident. Um, but it did surprise me, because I did expect that more people would find it important. On the other hand, continued professional development rated so highly throughout the survey. The entire survey was full of responses regarding continued professional development. So I found that 90% of participants who responded to my survey specified that they found it very important or important to undertake continued professional development at some point. Now this was uh, provided as an example to, to the to the translators who responded, it was things like self-study, um, workshops, conferences, online training courses, anything that you can think of that was a type of development was incorporated and translators were aware that this was what I meant by CPD. Similarly, 80% of respondents were, are undertaking CPD activities more than once a year, which really did sort of, I, I had my suspicions that Perhaps it's quite popular, but I didn't expect this question to resonate throughout my presentation, uh, throughout my research as much as it did. Um, I do have an interesting quote regarding CPD. One of the comments that was particularly interesting was one respondent, they were all anonymized, so um, perhaps they're in this room, I don't know, <laughs> but all the CPD and technology in the world will never make up for the lack of writing ability, inadequate linguistic competences, lack of general knowledge and intelligence. It is far more important for translators to read the newspaper every day than to mess about with social media and cat tools. I don't... <laughs> I personally, I really found this comment interesting because it seems to imply that they're mutually exclusive when they're not. Why can we not mess about with cat tools and social media and still read the newspaper every day and general knowledge? Why, why is that? So I did find it interesting. Had I had more space, I would have liked to have contacted this person um, and perhaps interviewed them some more, but I didn't have the facility as, as my dissertation as far as it went. So the main part, which I'm going to talk about, is skills. I don't know whether if you can make sense of the colours, the numbers, there's a lot going on in this graph. Um, but basically, my respondents found that linguistic skills, translation-related abilities, which is perhaps a given, and business and communication skills were the most important skill sets for a freelance translator to possess. Now, just to give you some indication of what I meant by, about, by such skills, I base this on competences that I reviewed in my literature review as part of my thesis. Linguistic skills is anything along the lines of grammar, form, structure, um, subject knowledge, specialist language, that sort of thing. Personality skills and attributes. Now, I am going to come back to this as to whether it can be considered a skill. But here, it refers to things like self-confidence, time management, organisational skills, all of the things that you sort of perhaps use, but not directly as part of your, your job day to day. Technological skills and attributes, it's things like cat tools. How proficient are you? And it goes back to what was said in the very first session. Um, 
clicking, there's a difference between clicking and pointing and actually being proficient in a, in a cat tool or social media or, you know, Microsoft programs, whatever. So that's what this was incorporating. Translation related abilities was the ability to render a, a source text into your target text. Um, anything along the lines of translation, knowing the market, knowing your texts, that sort of thing. And business and communication skills, which is probably the most obvious one. Um, networking, setting your rates, um, invoices, that sort of thing that a freelance translator does need to um, possess. So as you can see, the most prominent ones, as I said, were linguistic translation and business and communication. But what was particularly interesting is that, as you can see, there are still some number of people who specify very unimportant or or unimportant for things like translation-related abilities. I, admittedly, I didn't get the chance to delve further into that. I don't know whether it was an error. Perhaps they thought they were um, selecting very important and they didn't, or whether they don't find it important. I would be really interested if there's anybody in the room who has an opinion. I would, I would be very interested because I didn't, unfortunately, have the space to do that um, as part of my thesis. So. You can see here that technological skills and personality skills ranked lowest in terms of the, the lower amounts of people specifying that they were very important. What's really interesting about this is, as I'm going to talk about in my following slides, when I gave participants the option to correct me on any skills that I might have missed or anything that I might not have included in the survey, this was a lot of what come back several times. Now. I might be mistaken, but this, all of this could be considered a personality skill or an attribute. This was the type of skills that were included in that question. So it was interesting for me to see that in the previous slide, as you can see, eight, just eight people specified that it was extremely important. Yet when the, I gave them the option, this is what I got back. So things like curiosity, resilience, open-mindedness, there is a debate whether can such skills be considered skills or are they qualities perhaps or characteristics? Are they a skill? Um, I personally think yes. I think I do believe that they are a skill. Um, but I do think that sometimes certain things perhaps can't be learned and they are ingrained into somebody. So that, that this part did interest me. Um, with regards to technology as well, this was another really interesting one because it was ranked, as you, as you saw, it was one of the lower ones with just seven participants specifying it was extremely important to them. Throughout my entire, throughout all of the other questions where I gave participants chance to open up a little bit more, the things that were discussed most was technology. So cat tools, the ability to use computers, the ability to converse with people via the internet, use anything between computers. There were people that answered my questions that were, they, as in their words, not mine, were from the pre-computer era. They used typewriters. Now, they've had to learn a whole host of new skills to try and keep up with the market. So considering that they scored the lowest on the graph that I provided, they were really resonant throughout my research. There was so much focus. All of the CPD activities that are being taken place by the translators in my research, when I asked what they were, almost all of them were some sort of technological training, which leads me to think that there must be a demand for for such skills in an ever-changing market where things are becoming more technological. Um, I'm new to the market. I've been translating very, very, just a few months. I wanted to do my master's, set myself up. I've done limited translation work, but this is what seemed to me that I should be focusing on perhaps, technological skills and setting myself up as a, as a business. So just to recap, because. Um, this is a sort of a very brief overview of, of my research, but um, I did find that all of the skills that I presented to respondents were important. Be that graph that I showed you isn't reflective of that because obviously the numbers, they show differently, but throughout all of the other questions, I do believe that it is a mix of all five that I provided, personality, linguistic, translation related abilities that, that do make a successful freelance translator. 
I did learn the importance of CPD, um, more so perhaps than formal academic training. In terms of this small sample that I worked with, CPD was the focus, much more than having a degree in translation, which I did find interesting. I expected a lot more to confirm that they, they were really glad that they did a master's in translation. So that was a surprise to me. Um, obviously, my research was just limited. There was 24 participants in total. Um, it was just UK-based freelance translators. So I would be interested to see how these answers differed if we were to perhaps survey in-house translators or interpreters even. I mean, we go down a whole new avenue with that. Um, but I would be interested to see sort of how the results vary with different market, with different target audiences. Um, but also, I do think that it would be good to perhaps do some more research into continued professional development and masters and see whether there's a way to sort of maybe, I mean, my masters, for example, did combine um, continued professional development and we, we learned all about it. We learned how to do it. Technological, we had a module on CAT tools, Trados, all of the, what, what I felt, I, I felt like I knew, I found out. Um, but could there be more done perhaps to keep translation programs up to date with sort of, or should more efforts be put into CPD on the job training? Um, that's something that I do think would benefit from further research. Um, but in terms of sort of what I discovered, I do find it's been really useful for me at least to answer my questions um, and sort of give me some reinforcement. I personally still feel glad that I did my master's degree. Um, I learned a lot of theory and I know that there was the debate about theory and practical and what's, what's better. I felt I have an adequate mixture of um, theory and practical. I did a lot of both, but maybe I'm, I, I do enjoy research evidently. So maybe I like the theory for that reason. And that's the end of my talk. So I'm just gonna um, pass over to Who's Back to me. Uh, yeah. Thanks. You kept in t kept to time. That's brilliant. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much for the presentation. A round of applause. It's great to have had some uh, primary research for us to uh, to provide us as food for thought as we move now into a question and answer session. So I'd like to ask: Are there any questions from the floor for Megan in the light of her presentation? I have one question. Uh, which is, wh where did you draw a sample from? Um, I drew a sample based on a group of freelance translators that I contacted via the Northwest Translation Network. Um, there was, I went sort of around to go to the ITI, um, the Chartered Institute of Linguists, but I did derive my sample from the Northwest Translators Network. Um, I did make them, they, they signed a declaration form. They needed to be freelance, UK based, otherwise I didn't want it to, to skew my sample. So that was where I, I got the sample from. Uh, and are there any other questions, please? Yes, as I conducted a similar research, uh, some questions, specific ones. First of all, what was the number of the respondents? Uh, um, if, if definitely, there was a certain number. And uh, secondly, how did you select? Were there some criterion that you used to select uh, the, the those who that you questioned, or any actual freelancer with any experience and qualification could participate? And uh, finally, what was the background? Did you use EMT or some other? Just to, to make the, the question here. Thank so you. If I, I will try to answer all of those if I can just remember them. Um, the number of translators that were in the sample was 24 in total. Um, the 24 was, I used 24 who answered, sort of who went through the survey. There were a lot of translators who entered the survey, but then maybe stopped halfway through, or there was 24 answers. Um, this, I, the only recommend, well, the only requisite that they had um, was that they needed to be a freelance translator. By that, I did put in the declaration form. Um, that is what you type. That's what you call yourself. Your job. You you refer to yourself as a freelance translator, and that they were based in the UK. That's that was all that I did um, in terms of making sure that I got. And I think there was one more question. 
have I answered it? About the background, do you use EMT as a background for the questions or some other? No, I actually just used the Northwest Translators Network, so I didn't sort of, in terms of education, I didn't know what was what I was getting into, um, qualifications, nothing. I just wanted a set number of people to ask, so that was what I, I got. Uh, we've got two more questions from the floor in the center and then afterwards to the left. Let's maybe take them both together. Can you memory cope with that? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, still questions about the samples. If you look at the backgrounds, I don't know if you include the ages or the education background. And then if you analyze your, the, the answers, will it, uh, do you have any different, like for example, those who answers very important are those who have a translation study background, and then those who have been like 20 years in the industry, will they have like a different answers with those like just coming into the industry and so on? Yeah. I, this was one of my proposals for further research. Um, I would have loved to have gone a lot more into this. One of the things that really did interest me was the age difference. Um, I did ask a number of basic questions from all respondents, and one of them was age. One of them was length of time spent translating. Um, age ranged, we were just talking about this, the ages ranged from 24 to 70, 70 plus. So that could have been 70, anywhere above 70. Um, most of the respondents were between the brackets of sort of 40 to 60 years old, but there were a lot in the 20 to 30 bracket as well. Um, I did notice, I didn't formally analyse the ages and the connections because of just space in my dissertation, but I did do a bit of my own analysis. Um, and I did find that the younger the people, the younger the participants, the more important they found it to hold a master's degree in translation rather than those who were perhaps older. Um, I think it's kind of a given, but not always a given, that the more time spent translating, um, you, you might be older. That was mainly the case, but there were some people who were sort of in the 40 to 50 bracket, perhaps, who had maybe spent one year translating. So it was, it was, a, re it was a really interesting set of data that if I had another chance or if I could delve into it some more, I would really like to look at the ages and their opinions. Um, a lot of the CPD questions and the technology emphasis were from the older participants. Um, I would like to know whether that's because the younger are a generation that have grown up with technology. They don't feel that they need the skills, perhaps. I'm not sure. Um, but there was, there was discrepancies based on age, definitely. And just one final question. Yep. Lady at the back. Thank you. Well, you kind of, you've kind of answered the question because that was going to be precisely my question, so I'll make a comment if I may. My question was going to be what was the age range uh, of, the, of the people that you surveyed, number one. Um, but the other is a comment, which is I run lots and lots of events for translators, both new and established, which involve translation companies. And I can't think of any one of those kinds of workshops or seminars we've done where a representative of a translation company has not said that what we look for first and foremost when people send their CVs to us is whether they've done postgraduate uh, translation or interpreting training. So your results are surprising. You've perhaps partially answered why the, the result has come out as it has. That's really useful to know, actually, because there was a point through this process that I thought have I made a huge mistake in undertaking this master's degree and spending two years of my life, um, you know, finishing work every day and spending all evening and every weekend working on it. So that's, that's good to know. <laughs> Great, thanks for the questions. I've seen the questions that we've had on uh, Slido have basically been covered by the questions we've had from the floor. Say, so we'll move on to the next presentation, but maybe before we do that, I'd like to do a bit of primary research of my own. Uh, so we have representatives here. I'm going to ask three questions because we have representatives here from across the profession. I'd ask you to raise your hand if you're a working translator, whether it be full-time, part-time, you know, charity translation, whether you're a working translator in any capacity. Okay, and with those with your hand in the air, how many since entering the profession have taken part in a translation-related training course? 
And of those of you that have, how many have done it in the last 12 months? Okay, so it's interesting. So, uh, no, quite a lot of the working translators do take their own trans uh, training seriously and are actively pursuing that. I mean, that's, that's, that's great to see. Okay. Right now, so moving on, we're actually going to hear about some specific uh, training uh, courses which are run now in Slovenia. So I'll now hand the mic over to uh, our next speaker to continue the proceedings. Thank you so much, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Dobar dan. It's a privilege to be here today and to hear so many interesting talks. Um, Megan's presentation has laid the groundwork for our presentation, uh, which is on the importance of CPDs for translators. We will start with a brief overview of what we mean by CPDs and how translators, in particular legal translators, court interpreters can benefit from uh, attending CPDs. Our initial observations come from the field of legal translation, but hopefully they can be of use uh, for other spheres of specialized translation as well. Especially considering that certain issues uh, which um, are such as deprofessionalization and low status of translators, which have been addressed today, are perennial. And we will try to address these as well from the perspective of CPDs. Uh, my colleague Victoria will then tell you more about the Slovenian Association of Sworn Court Interpreters and Legal Translators. If you take a look at this slide, all of these aspects, training, knowledge, experience, are important for the profession of translators. But in this constellation, we assume that CPDs offer most leverage. They offer most leverage for developing expertise, expert skills, because one aspect is often overlooked, namely that experience by itself does not guarantee expertise, and that the today's market is increasingly skills-driven market. Skills are valued, and translators who uh, develop into the expertise, into uh, invest time in developing their expertise, are of course uh, professionals who thrive in this business. What we mean by CPDs, anyone who has tried his or her hand in translation has conducted some form of continuous professional development. Doing terminological research, consulting online databases, this would be an informal CPD. We here put the focus on more formal CPDs, more structured, lifelong learning programs. What is the purpose of CPDs? The purpose is not to teach translators how to do their work, how to do their job. The purpose is to help them develop expertise. And this is especially important given the low status of our profession. This was addressed earlier this morning. So as a way to boost the professional status, CBDs can also contribute. The concept by itself is not a novel idea. Actually, as I said, most of us are conducting one or the other form of CPD, self-education, and translation is a process which is like a never-ending learning experience. And most of us have a passion for learning. But the importance seems to be a given for certain professions. Lawyers, for example. Most professional code of conduct for lawyers provide that in order to carry out their profession with care and diligence, they must undergo some sort of continuous training. So this is implied by legal scholarship. This is how legal scholars interpret the meaning of carrying out one's profession with care and diligence. At the same time, it seems that translators can still benefit more 
by exploiting the full potential of CPDs. Why do they matter? In short, we can say that they allow professionals to stay abreast of relevant changes. They make us more responsive to change. Change is happening to all different spheres, technology, language, terminology. This is especially important. Terminology cannot be divorced from the field. If changes are happening to the terminological level, this is because of the underlying conceptual changes. New concepts emerge in the field of law, for example, undocumented immigrants. This term is not used in the EU, however. A distinction is made between irregular migration or legal migration. It's not easy to keep an upper hand in all of these changes. And it's not just the terms that are changing, it's the underlying concepts. And this is crucial for a better understanding of uh, the field of law and also for other fields, domains. Another aspect is the legal regulation of the profession. New directives are adopted, new regulations, which regulate the work of court interpreters and legal translators. By offering a chance to develop our expertise, CPDs boost professional status. How come? Well, one of the criteria for a group to qualify as a profession, or in other words, what is it that distinguishes an occupation from a profession is said to include expertise. This is a signal to all of those customers, clients, not everyone can do this. I am qualified to do this, and therefore I am a member of the profession. I'm a member of this professional group. I have expertise. And this is important, again, for translators in particular, because the translation profession is said to suffer from an inferior status, often described as a transparent medium, those who belong behind the scenes. As a matter of fact, from the perspective of the sociology of professions, translators are often described as a semi-professional or marginal occupation. They are not at the top of the professional prestige ladder, such as medicine, law, the legal profession in particular. These are known as the success stories of professionalism. And in today's world, where globalization processes, cross-cultural processes are so important, and translators play such an important role in these processes, this is a paradox. And here, we believe that there are lessons to be learned from other professions, those success stories, if you remember. How does it work with legal practitioners? Do they have to undergo training? I would now like to single out two examples of CPDs organized for the legal practitioners. Not only is legal training offered at the national level, meaning the level of the member states, it's also offered at the EU level, pan-European programs. This is important for the EU especially because it enhances judicial cooperation. It enables smooth operation of uh, legislative procedures, cross-border procedures. But it was said this morning by Commissioner Oettinger that Translators too contribute to legal certainty, if you recall, to mutual trust, acceptance. The EU believes that by investing into the education of legal practitioners, this goal is also achieved. EJTN is one such example and the other is HELP. I will just briefly explain the difference between them. European Judicial Training Network coordinates national training activities across the EU. The trainings offered by EJTN focus on two target groups, namely judges and prosecutors. In 2016, judicial training was offered to nearly 5,600 judges, prosecutors, trainers and trainees. 
as I said, the purpose is not just judicial cooperation, but also networking among judges and prosecutors across the member states. The second example, HELP, it's a platform for education which focuses on human rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, and as opposed to EJTN, HELP focuses on the target group of judges, prosecutors, and legal practitioners, lawyers. They offer a la carte, tailor-made approach with a huge potential for developmental adaptation to national training system. Um, they uh, specialize in e-learning, so building a, an e-platform for all legal pr practitioners across the EU. This is important. The purpose of these programs is to contribute to a uniform application of EU law here at the Convention, European Convention of Human Rights. But as we have seen this morning, and I'm sure many would agree, translators also contribute to this goal. Legal translations are a precondition for achieving uniform interpretation of EU law. And hopefully, we can also learn um, some valuable lessons from the legal courses and trainings offered for legal practitioners. And we will be able to boost the professional status of translators in future. Um, with this, I would like to finish and give the floor to my colleague, Victoria, who will tell you more about the Slovenian example and the work done by the Association of Sworn Court Interpreters. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everybody. I have to figure out which uh, screen is mine, but it's, it appears to be the one on the right side. Thank you so much. First of all, a thank you to the organizers to organizing such an interesting uh, event with uh, such an interesting topic and uh, to give us the opportunity to be able to speak in front of you. Uh, and then I definitely have to greet you in Slovene. Lepo pozdrav, Leni. Lep pozdrav, Slovenia. I know that you didn't understand that one, but I, it, it has to, the voice has to be heard in the mother tongue as well. So it's, it's a nice greeting from Slovenia, and um, it, it's a lovely country. Okay, some... some okay, ah, great. It's over here. So um, Yes, Martina was introducing was preparing a very nice introduction about what the CPD is in a larger sense in the sense of um, the event and education in the uh, legal um, from the legal aspect I will focus now on um, the aspect in Slovenia on the court interpreter um, the court interpreter in Slovenia is called Sodni Tolmac. Now, it is, of course, um, a bit of a problem to continue from this point onwards to talk about a court interpreter because your understanding of a court interpreter is, in English, is different from what you understand um, by uh, talking about a sodnitul match in Slovenia. So I have to clarify that first of all. A court interpreter in Slovenia is a person who is primarily, mostly, doing sworn uh, court translation. Um, of course, a court interpreter um, is also a person appearing in court in court hearings and uh, interpreting. But the work done by a court interpreter in Slovenia is to up to 80% much more in translation than in interpreting. Um, the work or the education for court interpreter in Slovenia is prepared and conducted by the Ministry of Justice. Uh, there is no institutionalized uh, education for court interpreters, so it's um, um, a, some sort of a preparatory uh, seminar uh, that 
um, candidates, uh, people interested in becoming a court interpreter, may attend or may not because they're not obligatory, they're optional. Um, so the focus of the sworn court interpreter in Slovenia is, um, of course, on helping um, to um, fulfill all the rights, the personal rights of every individual. But it is very much in the hands of uh, the legal experts. So being run by the uh, Ministry of Justice, you also have a very strong board of people on the panel who are in charge of the um, selection of court interpreters. Um, you will have judges, legal experts, um, people from academia, but then again um, from the um, uh, Faculty of Law uh, and the Slovene Judicial Training Center. Now, this is also a reason why people from other fields are also attracted to become court interpreters, not only linguists and transla translators, if I may distinguish uh, the translators from the other ones that are doing like uh, language teaching or other sorts of jobs. Um, so it, we have candidates coming from um, fields like uh, civil engineering. We have candidates coming from medicine, uh, from economics and so on. Uh, and of course, Obviously, they are missing uh, the education of uh, in interpreting and in translation in particular. But they do know their field. Uh, they have expertise in, um, in uh, they, ha they have knowledge in the legal area, obviously. Uh, and they obviously have knowledge in the language. So it's somehow, okay, I pressed the wrong button, sorry. Um, it somehow came natural that um, all those people have to be eventually represented by someone. Um, a colleague of mine and me and some other people, we started um, talks with the representatives of the Ministry of Justice and we said, okay, um, all those court interpreters, they have no uh, mutual tie, they are not connected. They actually need some sort of um, speaker, they need an association. And uh, this, is, uh, this was brought up in 2006, um, the idea of uh, establishing an association for sworn court interpreters and legal tra translators. But the aim of a, an association and the goal of an association, of course, is definitely to bring together, uh, to connect people, to educate them, to deliver uh, continuous professional development, to act as a professional body. But this is uh, easier said than done. So... Um, that's the wrong, I'm sorry. It keeps going to, oh, it, it goes backwards. Ah, okay, it's, ah, I'm sorry, I'm just so stupid for that. <laughs> okay, the benefits for members. So, uh, of course, once you think about establishing an associ association, um, you also focus on the benefits for members. I mean, to become a member of an association, you want to have, first of all, financial benefits. Uh, for example, in, in particular for translators, you would like to have the opportunity to get additional translation jobs. You want to get low-cost um, educational opportunities. You also uh, expect to receive tailor-made uh, professional development programs and so on and so forth. And of course, there is also the need to gather. Um, altogether, uh, to sum up, of course, an association is great, an association, an association is idealistic, but can it deliver all of that? Uh, to being myself a, a representative of an association, I would say, um, yes, it, it tries to achieve all of that. But there is no ideal association. You can only try to achieve the, the best of the best. So we, when we were thinking about establishing the association, we also came across the question, um, if we're going to organize uh, CPDs, which obviously we were planning to, the question was, will they be consumer or quality driven? Uh, to be an association is 
uh, in a way, uh, we are non-profits organizations, first of all. And you, the, you, you spend most of your free time working for a mutual goal. You do it with passion. But still, you figure out in the end that uh, participants, potential members, are in f of course, they are uh, interested in quality, but in fact, they are also consumers, like uh, you and I are when we go to a shop and we buy something. We want to get everything um, for um, as, less, uh, as little as possible. We want to have good quality. But this is something where you come across the, the point where you say, okay, uh, am, I, am we, are we going to, to change from a non-profit organization to a company offering great uh, education with great speakers that can be paid in a great way? So... The, so, the, our association, the Association of Sworn Court Interpreters and Legal Translators of Slovenia Skit, was focusing on all these points beginning in 2006. Um, we were established in 2012, so you would probably think, what were they doing six years? They were thinking of, of all these things for six years. Yes, we did. We prepared in a very, very thorough way. We didn't want to make mistakes. We wanted to give uh, additional value to our branch. We focused very much on, on everything that is usually missed, like uh, we try to identify newcomers from other professions, late career changes, of course. Uh, people who are dealing with uh, court interpreting and court translating, some of them have an education in translation, others don't. Not because they don't come from, they come from a different area, but because there wasn't any education in their time. We've heard about that in the morning. Um, others, again, think it's not necessary. Um, and then uh, the third part is, they would say, okay, um, I'd love to work as a court interpreter, but for me, it's just an additional job. It's very good, it's very good money, it's a very good income, but I don't need to spend money on getting an education if I know a little bit about law and I know the other language, the foreign language I can work from. So um, we tried to um, raise the level of awareness. Now, of course, this is probably something everybody would say. We are the best, and you won't find anyone else who is better than us. No, we wanted to be different. We focused much more on quality than on quantity. And um, it, is, it is difficult to pursue such a goal. So, as you've heard, we have been established in 2012. Up to this day, November 2017, we have 87 members. Okay, this is not much, but Slovenia is a beautiful and small country. We only have two million inhabitants. So if you cross out one million, because this one million are children, or minors, then you have the rest. And if you cut them down again, you will find that um, there is a total number of court interpreters for, in total, 37 languages, up to, uh, uh, there is a total of um, court interpreters of a number of 660. So these 660 court interpreters represent 37 languages in Slovenia. We really have a great range uh, of um, professionals who um, represent and help um, court hearings and uh, everyone who just needs uh, the work, the help of a court interpreter. Uh, now, there is something else I haven't mentioned so far. The Ministry of Justice has introduced in 2012 um, a new regulation into the regulation for court interpreters, 
which demands us to attend five continuous professional development events in a course of fi five years. This course of five years has expired in January this year. So th the reason behind that was not as some stakeholders in Slovenia claim um, uh, uh, the um, Sorry, I don't know the English word, but I will, the directive, yeah, it would be Richtlinie in German. The directive 64 slash 2010 slash EU, which demands uh, that uh, translating and interpreting in criminal, criminal court hearings has to be implemented in all EU member states. No, it was not that reason that in 2012 the Ministry of Justice decided to introduce this new regulation. It was because we had a lot of member, um, sorry, not members, uh, court interpreters who would not educate themselves at all. We had um, experienced translators, but also uh, those who did it once or twice a year uh, appear as a court interpreter. So um, there was a suddenly there was a great demand for uh, court interpreting seminars uh, on legal subjects and on um, and on language um, specific subjects, which was con conducted or which is conducted by several institutions, by other associations, and also by us. So we. Um, in these five years, we prepared approximately, um, I would say, 12 uh, CPDs. Those people you can see here uh, listed behind me are one of the finest speakers. They're not the only ones. Um, but we tried to uh, focus in particular on those who really have something to say. Now... They do come from faculties, but they are also at the same time um, this m uh, specialist that can focus on law and languages uh, in an equal way. And to finish uh, my presentation, um, together with Martina's part, um, I would like to uh, show you a picture. This is us, the board of directors. I think we look pretty on that picture. Um, why am I showing you this picture? It's because we try to raise awareness by showing people who we are. Now, you have below the picture, you have um, the information on who we are, not the names. We are a board of directors uh, of the association that consists of a judge, of a notary, of a notary assistant and of a university teacher. And that is really a strong message. Okay, thank you very much for listening to us and enjoy the rest of this session. So thanks very much, uh, Martina and Victoria, for the presentation. I'm mindful of the time, and we're running ever so slightly behind. So I'd just quickly ask whether there's maybe one or two questions from the floor. Otherwise, I'll take our Slido question. Yeah, if we take the question that I can see dead ahead to that. Good afternoon. Annette Schiller from Ireland. Thank you for a very interesting two speakers. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, do all... Um, court interpreters and translators in Slovenia have to be a member of your association. And the second question is, what is the penalty if they don't attend CPD events, the five over five years? Okay, it, ah, it starts. The answer to the, to the first question, no. There is no obligatory membership uh, for court interpreters, but um, to be members of our association, but whoever um, um, applies for membership in our association has to be a court interpreter. So we do not accept people who are um, doing other sorts of translation. 
this is one thing. Um, to uh, the answer to the second question, yes, they are um, uh, punished in a way. Uh, well, actually, in 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 a, in a real, there are real consequences. Um, in January 2017, um, a panel of experts at the Ministry of Justice was looking through the certificates that, was, that were handed in by the court interpreters in Slovenia, and they went through uh, each one of them. Uh, they didn't check the quality of the CPDs, but they did check if they complied with what they uh, instructed us that we had to attend to. Uh, CPDs in a, in a legal matter, in a legal subject, and three CPDs in the respective language we are a court interpreter in. If we didn't comply to these uh, demands, they would um, um, send us a note saying um, you would have to hand in some additional certificate. Now, some just forgot to hand a certificate in. Others who didn't attend um, were taking away uh, the title of being a sworn court interpreter, which means they would have to hand back their stamp. Uh, they would be deleted from the list of, from the registry of sworn court interpreters of Slovenia. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, and I'll maybe take the Slido question here, quite a pertinent question. How do you attract new members to the association? We do not do um, any kind of commercials, if that is um, the correct answer. It would be, um, I'm not working with English, that's why I keep switching to German. It would be Werbung in Deutsch, in German. Um, so we do not um, publicize ourselves in any way. We believe that we are quality driven and everyone who uh, uh, appreciates quality, will find us, will find the way. We are not uh, going to shout out. I personally hate all those uh, direct marketing, marketing representatives who call you up and ask you, um, good afternoon, would you like to buy, a, I don't know, washing machine? No, I don't want to buy one. And it's the same with our association. I'm not going to ask anyone. I'd love to have less members, to have true members. I really want to have devoted ones. Um, and that is what counts. You have to have passionate um, believers of your profession, then this profession can grow and thrive. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, and now I'd say let's move swiftly on to our final presentation. It's now over to Anne Brooks. Thank you very much, Ryan. I'll just wait for my presentation to come up. Thank you very much, everyone, for staying. <laughs> I've seen a few people slip out the door. <laughs> and no one's falling asleep, which is good. So thank you. Oh, it's on there, but not here. OK. So I joined ITI in 2013. Um, ITI is a membership organization based in the UK, but we have members worldwide. A degree is a great starting point um, for any profession. And just to give you some figures, because obviously I'm based in the UK, there's an association of graduate recruiters, and they carried out a membership survey. Um, and in 2016, there were 13,156 vacancies for graduates. And 5.4% of those vacancies remained unfulfilled in 2016. Now, there's a lot of universities in the room, so somebody could have a guess at this. How many students do you think graduated in 2016 in the UK? No one's going to have a guess. Okay, um, I'm going to tell you 300,000. So the question is, why doesn't the supply match the demand? Why were those vacancies unfulfilled. And this is what we've come to um, know as the skills gap in the UK. So we know that not all vacancies are being fulfilled and that there is, a, you know, um, what we call um, a misalignment of expectation. An MA 
you know, will give a freelancer a great start to a translation career. And the European um, Masters in Translation has a competence profile which defines those basic competences that you need to survive, um, to work successfully in today's market. But still, those students are coming out unaware of the challenges that are faced by language service providers. Managing that gap of, you know, trying to bring studying and work together is tricky in any profession, but especially in this profession. So who is the ideal candidate? Now, I deal with a lot of language service providers and graduates, and language service providers often say, well, the first problem that we have is the graduates come out and the translation speed is slow, or they're not familiar with CAT tools, or they might know one CAT tool, but they don't know all the CAT tools. Then they don't have any business skills or formatting skills. Um, um, they, they have some attention to detail, but they don't follow or read instructions. They don't know what track changes are. Okay. <laughs> And then what do the graduates say? Well, the graduates say, well, actually, we are technical. We're, you know, we know all about social media. That's great. Absolutely brilliant. Um, we uh, aren't always available or flexible or prepared to work those long hours that the agencies want us to do. Um, the other thing that they say is that um, the expectations of an agency, the amount of skills that they need to know, those soft skills, understanding the importance of deadlines, perhaps it's not so important to them, or where they fit into the process, they don't realize that to begin with. So there is what we call an expectation gap. So whose responsibility is it to manage that expectation gap? Well, we could go back and s to where they came from, and that's the universities. Now, a lot of universities do some of the things that I'm going to say. But, you know, in the UK, w MAs are usually just one year. So in a year, which is not really a year, it's probably nine months, they have to fit in so much into that program that perhaps they can't do some of these things. But, you know, they could offer degree apprenticeships, work placement schemes or internships. If they haven't got the time to accommodate that into the program, perhaps they could work with language service providers or professional bodies um, to help those students come out ready for the workplace. The next um, person who could help in this or plays a vital role is the translator themselves or the graduate because they need to be um, honest and realize what their weaknesses are, or I'm gonna change that around based on the presentation that was delivered this morning. Perhaps uh, um, identify what their strengths are and build on those strengths. So come up with a plan of how they're going to become an expert in the areas that they want to work in. Um, ITI members have access to a CPD login tool so they can log in their CPD and they can plan, do and review that CPD to evaluate it. Oh, you can't hear me, sorry. Then language service providers, they play a vital role in managing that expectation gap because you could argue that they kind of drive it a little bit too. So they need to collaborate with universities, with professional bodies. They need to attend events like this. And I know there was somebody here this morning, so that's great. But they could also write articles in publications that we produce, really talking about the trends and what is happening in the marketplace. Because I, um, three weeks ago, I met up with a couple of language service providers, and they were talking about that um, they're now translating Twitter feeds. And with Twitter, it has to be very instant. You can't wait three weeks for that job. It has to be there and now, because otherwise that thread closes. So they need to tell the industry more about what's happening and the trends in, in the industry. And then finally, professional bodies. So I can give you the example of ITI, because that's the one I know. So. 
at ITI, we give lots of practical information on how to become a translator. And we have networking groups, language groups that are offering mentoring schemes and subject groups as well that do that. We also have regional groups that put on a lot of events. The one that you mentioned, um, the Northwestern group, they do a lot of events. And that's a great way for newcomers to meet experienced translators in an informal setting. And you learn so much from those events. Um, the other thing that we do is we collaborate with a lot of our members and we have um, language service providers, universities, um, all kinds of members and we try to work with them um, producing CPD but also partner entities such as the Association of Translation Companies and FIT and GALA and SENSE and MET. We try and work with those to ensure that we know what the issues are that are facing translators and interpreters. So when I joined, one of the first things that I was asked to do was to produce something um, basically for people coming into the industry, the translation sector, whether it's um, graduates or people who've been a lawyer and have moved across to translation. And I basically came up with this course that's called Setting Up as a Freelance Translator. It's an online course, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. And it's over an eight-week period, and it covers not um, the skills that you need to be a good translator, because we're not going to teach you that. What we're going to teach you is the skills that you need to have to survive in this industry. So really, it's how do you get started um, how do you get over the no experience barrier? How do you make yourself visible? Um, how, how do you produce a, a tailor-made CV for language service providers? Or how do you contact clients? Um, things like invoices, because believe it or not, people don't know how to produce an invoice or a quote. How do you set rates? There's a lot of questions, like that's probably one of the key ones that were asked. The practicalities from working from home, because freelancers don't work in an office, so what do they need to know about data protection? Um, um, developing a specialism as well, we cover that. So there are eight areas that we cover, and um, there are lots of activities that they do over that eight-week period. I just want to tell you what the benefits are for the students. So the first benefit is that they have direct access to eight practicing translators. And the translators are very different people. So if you have in mind what a freelance translator looks like, well, these eight people are so different. And I really mean that from age to specialism to languages to how they speak. Some of them are bold, some of them are softly spoken, so they are very different people. Um, the other thing that comes across very quickly is that they all are professionals in their own right, and they always maintain that throughout their lectures, so to speak, if you can imagine that. But um, they treat it as a profession, and they value um, CPD and training and they have done for many years and they impart pearls of wisdom that you're not going to learn just by using Google you know they've they've had to learn the hard way and they share that with the students and they give so much more than I could have ever asked them to give and then the third thing that I think that works really well is the peer-to-peer -peer learning um, that, that some of the exercises that are set on the on, on the course are very interesting. For example, they're asked to translate a document and it's, we're not reviewing the translation. Bear in mind, we're not teaching them how to translate here, but when you receive a document and you're asked to translate it, we're looking at the formatting of it because it's those areas that language service providers have said to us where people are falling short. They don't have the formatting skills. And believe you me, 20 students, the document is looks different and you expect to see the same document and you don't. So peer-to-peer -peer learning is really important and the students learn a lot from each other. And the third thing that this course gives that I don't know about other courses is the continuous support. It's over eight weeks but it doesn't stop at eight weeks because there's a forum 
and students um, have interaction with the tutors in the forum and that continues after the eight week period. Um, it was set up in 2014. Now we're 2017, we've got just under 200 students and on each cohort, every single time, at least 30% of students find a job before the end of the course. So the success is, is phenomenal really for ITI and it's become a flagship for ITI. It's done incredibly well. So I'm very proud of that course. And I think after that, there was a lot of pressure to produce something else. Because obviously, a lot of you know that CPD is not just for new entrants. It's also for seasoned practitioners and anything in between. So, you know, it's not just about the people coming into the industry. It's about keeping those people into the industry. And as a result of the SEF course, then we produce the advancing course. So hopefully, you know, we will continue to produce, keep producing other courses because it's important that our members take stock of where they are now and put into practice what they learn for later on. So CPD is for life. So at ITI, I didn't produce a nice picture like you of um, everyone at ITI, but I love dogs. So what I wanted to say is that CPD is one way to stand out. It shows your commitment to the industry. So if you do do CPD, especially ITI members, and I know there are some of you in the room, that we have a CPD login tool. If you complete your 30 hours a year, you will get a certificate at the end of the year. A lot of members display that certificate on their own website and also display the logo on their profile. Now... The 30 hours, where does that come from? There's an association called the Professional Association of Research Network, and that's their recommendation. It's best practice. So we're just in line with their best practice. But ITI is more than just CPD. We provide lots of learning community, uh, learning opportunities from face-to-face -face events like workshops, um, the conference that we do, but also webinars, online courses. And this is great for networking, for mentoring, peer support. And, you know, what it does is it opens a door. Sometimes it, open, it gives members the opportunity to get a client or to co-work with another member. I've seen this happen many times, but it certainly leads to greater job satisfaction. So... You know, there are some ITI members in the room, and maybe you'd like to validate that. But, as with everything, there are some challenges. And the biggest challenge for me, I suppose, is time. Because there isn't enough time to cover all the training requirements of all the members. So, it's trying to, you know, assess which are the most important and being able to identify those can be tricky. To begin with, um, you know, I did surveys to try and find out um, what members wanted, but now we've created a dialogue and some members come email me regularly to say, can we have some training on this area, which if there is a demand, we try to put that on. The other problem that I have occasionally is finding those high quality speakers just like you. It is about quality, so how do you find those speakers? I work very closely with the Professional Development Committee and w we find speakers through recommendation. So that's one of the ways that we find them. Um, the other problem, well, it's not really a problem, it's a challenge, um, is value for money because all the freelance translators that I know that are out there, um, they don't want to pay a lot for their training. So there is a limit to how much we can charge. So it's just being able to, I, to ensure that we keep the costs down where possible in terms of the location of it. Location is another problem in itself because our membership base is worldwide. So we try and do things around the country, but predominantly all the CPD we've done so far has been in the UK, although we do a lot online. At the moment, I'm running um, two online courses, and we have students uh, from New Zealand, America, you know, from all over the world. So that, that is good. Um, 
And then the other thing, and I think lots of us face this challenge, is to promote lifelong learning. But then one of the skills that has come out throughout the day was curiosity. And uh, particularly the keynote speaker said, you need to take risks, you need to put yourself out of your comfort zone. So I think I've ticked those two boxes right now. Um, so, you know, it's to do things that you wouldn't normally do. And I think all of us are promoting that here today from what I've heard so far. So my last thing is really, <coughs> let's work together. So why am I saying that? Because competition is no longer from the translator on the other side of the world. It's now online. It's Google Translate. That's your competitor in a way. So ITI, we, we need to work with everyone in the supply chain to ensure that the next generation of translators are the best. So we need to work with language service providers. We need to work with universities. We need to work with you know, direct clients as well and partner entities. There was um, a symposium recently called Speak to the Future, and Dr. Adam Marshall, the Director General of the British Chamber of Commerce, said, we don't need any more qualifications. What we need is people who can get the job done. So we've developed a research network that now includes universities, language service providers, translators, and interpreters so that we can hear what the issues are that are faced and also we can promote the highest standards within the industry. So working together, we can manage expectation and provide new experiences to ensure that we get the graduates and the professionals that we want for the future. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anne. Uh, any questions from the floor for Anne? Yes, I can see one right in front. Go ahead. Um, yes, what, uh, since you've been with ITI, have you identified any particular trends in the type of CPD offering that you've, that you've been asked for over the years? Um, when I first joined, we probably focused on things like writing skills because that was deemed an important skill for a translator. But now we're looking at, interestingly enough, because of the ladies on the stage, we're doing more specialised workshops. So the next workshop that we have is a legal workshop, but it's in dual language. It's French and English because translators want more and more specific training so it's not just legal it's now in the language as well so i'm i'm trying to go down that path thank you okay and uh, another question in the front yep. uh, not a question but a very uh, short intervention very quickly uh, i'm mirko silvestrini the vice president of the uatc the european union of associations of translation companies and uh, uh, just to reassure all of you that uh, we are here today with the president of the association and the two vice presidents of the associations. And uh, what I want to transmit is an important message. Uh, we are uh, very ready to cooperate with all of you. We come every time. Uh, we have our Slovenian Association of Translation Companies ready to cooperate with you. Cyclopea is one of our members uh, in the Croatian uh, Association of Translation Companies. And of course, ITI, we work uh, with the ATC and, uh, uh, and the FIT. Uh, we, we are having meetings with the FIT president. So uh, we will bring all our support because as this morning they said correctly, we need first of all hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that positive message. Uh, and one quite specific question from Slido for you, Anne. Do you have to be a member of the ITI in order to take part in any of the, of the, of the courses that you run? No. Uh, we welcome all, everybody. You don't have to be a member. Obviously, there are benefits if you are a member, but non-members are very welcome. And if any non-members want to tell me what training requirements they want, then please do. Okay. Uh, and any more questions from the floor at all before I start wrapping up, maybe? Uh, yes, one at the back there. It's more a comment than a question. Um, sister associations of the ITI, sister associations, will be able to take part in CPD sessions at member rates, as far as I know. People may not be aware of that. Okay, It's Thank an you. agreement uh, under Fit Europe Association, Fit General, I think, but uh, specifically Fit Europe Associations. Okay, thank you for that. Great. Uh, yes, and 
one more there. Yeah. Yes, uh, as I happen also to be involved in CPD, I have a very specific question. Uh, do you uh, take uh, rather general topics uh, for your webinars and for CPD, uh, which are actually um, monolingual, so they do not require bilingual, just a, a pair of languages, or do you, do you take specific topics which require some specific language pairs, and if so, what language pairs do you cover? Thank you. Okay, uh, at the moment all the webinars that we do are in English, but I'm very happy. I have recently had discussions uh, with a couple of Spanish people to do a webinar in Spanish. I'm very happy to do them in other languages because I know that that's what some of our members are requesting. So we can have a chat afterwards. Brilliant. Okay. Great. Well, what I'm really uh, pleased to see is that there's a really coherent message coming from this afternoon session. I mean, we heard from Megan Wright at the start that um, freelancers have identified as a real priority uh, their own uh, continuing professional development. We saw from the floor that uh, many of you, in fact, the vast majority of you who are working uh, translators are actively pursuing your own professional development. I don't know whether we've got the outcome to the poll there again. Uh, okay. Slightly different. They're saying that maybe consolidating the skills uh, comes best from uh, translating translation experience. But still, a fair number uh, believe that formal training and attending courses is a successful way successful way of uh, acquiring uh, translation skills over the course of the profession. Uh, those that selected other means, well, we can see here. You're saying experience and training. They're the two key buzzwords uh, that I would say could come out of this session. Uh, so all in all, I hope that it does paint uh, a positive picture of the way in which we're going. And of course, we've heard two uh, great examples of industry-led uh, training courses which are being organized by our peers and that are clearly successful. Uh, so we've got uh, a need there that seems to be being met also by a supply. Of course, the one uh, slightly delicate question is, of course, the financing of all this. Um, we know that uh, industry associations often often stretched for finance. Uh, universities, too, don't have unlimited resources. That's possibly uh, an obstacle that needs to be reconciled. But uh, in general, I hope you'll agree with me uh, as I close this session in uh, stating that we have a positive situation now in the sector, uh, and it's great to see that uh, translators are taking their own training seriously.